the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, we're going to pick it up in the 12th chapter of St. John, about verse 37 here in a moment. First, remember what has happened in this chapter. You've been given a countdown to a specific Passover day. It began with six days before Passover, and then it cut down to five, grace. And then a voice came from above. It was our Heavenly Father. And he said, it's time for the prince of this world to be cast out, to cast down, meaning from heaven where he is, as it's written in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, that he's to be cast down to earth. That's the sixth trump when that transpires. And, uh, and certainly... Um, from the five seals and the fifth trump, you better get ready for the sixth. Uh, okay, so having said that, with all the miracles of Lazarus being raised from the dead and, um, and other things, there were still some that didn't believe. And of course, the muckety ducks from downtown, they wanted rid of him because he was empty and people, uh, they couldn't perform miracles, Christ could and he was harming, they felt, their church by going in, throwing out the money changers, letting the old dove and might infested doves loose, cleaning God's house. Um, so with that being said, chapter 12, verse 37, let's go with it with the word of wisdom from our Father. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, right in front of them. You know, I, I want you to think about something a moment. You believe today because you read of these miracles. You believe today and you haven't seen. These people actually witnessed these miracles taking place and they still didn't believe. So that's why God is so pleased with you when you try because you haven't seen Therefore, hope is eternal, and hope is counted and strengthens faith, that you have faith in him to know these things happen. That's why he loves you so much. He didn't have to put on a sideshow a side for you, for you to believe the word of God. That pleases him very much. Um, verse 38, that the saying of Isaiah, uh, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? <clears throat> and of course, this is Isaiah 53, where it speaks of his burial, even in the rich man's tomb, that would be Joseph of Arimathea's, that he would be delivered up, he wouldn't open his mouth. So he's making preparation here for that time, verse 39. Therefore, they could not believe because that Isaiah, or Isaiah said again, verse 40, he had blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, <clears throat> excuse me, that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted, and I should heal them. This throws many people, you can find the account in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. <clears throat> Why would God blind them where they couldn't see? And when you try to plant seeds and it falls on dead ears, you better listen carefully. Okay, if, if our Heavenly Father has blinded them and hardened their ears, who are you? That you think you could plant a seed after you planted one and make it grow. You can't. Okay. What, what is the reason for this? Anyone, especially in this generation in which the false messiah will come, if, if you are not uh, well-founded in God's word and you were to worship him because you were weak and, um, and, and not one of God's elect, then that's unforgivable. So God kind of put a cloak of ignorance over them where there is no sin 
And then in the millennium, this is why there will be teaching. I know it offends many people when I say that, but it's biblical. Why do you think in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5 and 6, it says we will be priests with Christ for a thousand years? What do priests do? Priests teach. They teach discipline and order. <clears throat> so naturally, there will be teaching there. So God knows whom he can use, and he knows those that need protection. Verse 41. These things said Isaiah, Isaiah, when he saw his glory and spake to him. When he, when, when he saw the glory of the living Father and God giving him instruction. 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue. They'd be excommunicated. They didn't want that. You might say, well, who would that be? Well, Nicodemus, for one. But he, he came at night and worshiped Christ and kept it a secret. And, of course, uh, Mary's own uncle, that's the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, her own uncle, Joseph of Arimathea, was also a member of the Sanhedrin. <clears throat> First, and certainly he worshiped. Because even as we know from history, not biblical, but history, <clears throat> man's history, that Christ accompanied him to Glastonbury more than one time where he is called to this day Joseph the Tin Man. Because he had tin mines there. He was very wealthy. Verse uh, 43 to continue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. That's something you never, ever want to do. Never worship a man, or never praise a man, but praise the living God that gave us all things. God sends people, but worship and glory the word of God, not man. That's the way many people can be sidetracked if you're not very careful. Because if you start, you know, this is one of Satan's main tricks. Is, is to really, I mean, brag. This is the, his M.O. He'll really brag you up. Oh, I can tell you're a good, good person. You have knowledge and wisdom, but, and there it comes, see. And, and that's, that's the way Satan leads people uh, astray. So uh, you want to remember who we glory. It's our Father. He's the one that sent us this letter. And when you study the letter he has sent to you, and you pray for knowledge, and for that knowledge to be revealed, he's not going to disappoint you. When you never tire, God doesn't like a quitter, stay with it and be blessed. Um, verse 44, Jesus, um, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And here, you know, Christ is even putting himself to the side for God, but of course he's Emmanuel, God with us. Understand that. 45, and he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. If you see me, you've seen the Father. You know, many, many are so confused by the word of God where God himself and the very start of the book of Genesis said, let us create man in our image. He included himself. And when the only um, begotten came forth, he was in the perfect image of the living God. Do you know, this is, you hear me use the Hebrew name of man, eth ha -adam. In chapter 2, this is one of the first places that Eth Ha Adam appears, even when all the races were being formed, because Eth Ha Adam was Christ Himself. And that gives you a lead into how to understand the eighth day man. So, if, if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father, why? Isaiah chapter 7, that same Isaiah, verse 14. A virgin shall conceive and bear a child, and you shall call him Emmanuel, 
being interpreted, God with you. Verse 46, I am come a light unto the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. Now, there's a lot in that short little verse. You will find the explanation of it in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, where Jesus, uh, um, where, where our Heavenly Father, he had Moses up on the mountain. And he's given Moses a lot of instructions. And all of a sudden, as Moses is about ready to go down, he said, hey, wait just a minute. Who am I going to say sent me? In other words, I, I want to know by what, whose name and what authority that I'm going down there and lay these law on the people. And of course, in, in that third chapter of Exodus, Almighty God said in his language, which is to say, I am that I am. So I, I want you to look at this verse very carefully, verse 46. See how Christ worded it. I am. I am sent him. I am is the name of the Father. Again, you can document it in Exodus 3.14. Came a light, and Christ was that light, into the world, into this dispensation, into this dimension where you could see him. That whomsoever believeth on me, that's the light, should not abide in darkness. Why? Because the light dispels darkness. When you learn the truth, there's nobody can take that away from you. When you see the real plan of the living God, you would not trade anything in this world for that. Why? Because it's eternal life. It's the only thing that really has solidity to it as far as eternal. And it's priceless is being chosen and being loved by and returning the love to I am. And certainly, I'll, I'll take that one step further. Iya Asha Iya is the beginning, if you would, the etymology that brings forth the consonants Y-H-V-H. -H. That's a sacred name. And that's why many are blessed when you use Yahweh, not Yahweh with a W, but Yahweh with a V. Why? Well, because God himself put the sacred name for man's consumption in the book of Esther. Five times it is hidden in the book of Esther. Once as I am that I am, the others... Um, uh, giving his name, Yahweh, two times forward and two times reversed. Hope it, you know, get the point, I am that I am, and that being his name. And I'll leave that there, but Christ is showing you that God so loved this world, that he gave this light, that whosoever would believe would not be in darkness. I mean, you're going to learn the truth. Verse 47, and if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Well, this is the light speaking, not I am. Verse 48. He that rejecteth me, that's the light, and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Well, what is this word? The word it was in the beginning. The word was with God. The word was God. It's God's word. And if you don't believe God's word, what, what he's saying here in the last day, well, what is the last day? It was the last day of the millennium. Well, what, what day is that? That's a great white throne judgment. In other words, you will definitely at the end of the millennium be judged by how you have accepted the word of I am. 
hopefully the light bearer that came to shed light where you'll never be in darkness will alleviate any anxieties you might have and let the Holy Spirit come into you whereby you can see the depth. But yet at the same time, the simplicity in which Christ teaches, so easily understood when you let it flow over the buds of your mind. Uh, you don't want to be out of step on that last day, that great white throne judgment, because that judgment is the second death, that meaning the death of the soul, 49. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, I am, spoke through me. He gave me a commandment. I am gave the light the commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Verse 50, and I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Hang on to that. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. So th that's, th that is a beautiful saying by the Lord Jesus Christ. That he, he lets you know that he reflects, even as he walked the earth and performed these miracles, he was reflecting I am, that's to say our Father. And so it was that uh, he was with him. And if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. Why? Because he was Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, you, you have to go, you know, our Heavenly Father is in spirit, which is a different dimension than we see in the flesh. That's why a man can't live and see God, because he's in a different dimension. So therefore, you, you have to die to be transported into that dimension before you can see God. Uh, it isn't that many people might say, well, I've read where it says if you see the face of God, you're dead. Yeah, that's the only way you can is a different dimension. Now, as a pastor of many years, I have experienced at many deathbeds people in the transition of passing that are able to begin to see into that dimension because they recognize people, loved ones, that have passed on years before. And it's not, not uh, it is God's way of comforting someone in that transition, but uh, going into that dimension. Don't, don't make that a complicated thing. We're flesh, and God is spirit. Uh, and do you know what you were before you came here? You had a spiritual body. That's your real body. And do you know what you're going into when you leave this earth? Back into your spiritual body. That's your real body. Okay. Uh, again, make that not a complicated thing. It's beautiful. Chapter 13, verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world, this dimension, unto the Father returning, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end, right to the end. I, I want to call your attention to one word in this particular verse. It's Passover. Do you know what it is in the manuscripts? It's uh, Passover. And if you go into the book of Acts and see the word Ishtar that many people celebrate, do you know what it is in the manuscripts? It's Passover. It's supposed to be Passover. And some, someone took the liberties to translate it into Ishtar. That's bad when you know better. Uh, verse 2. And supper was ending. The, it was being ended. The supper was being ended. The devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Uh, this, this Satan is going to... Uh, you see... I don't want you to overlook God's plan, the I am. The Kenites wanted to take Christ 
they weren't going to do it on this Passover because of the people. But God arranged to have this betrayer right in the midst that made it possible for Christ to be betrayed on that Passover and um, it would be well with the people most. Okay, So therefore, um, God uses even Satan. And, and you might say, well, why would he do that? Well, back in chapter 12, when, when um, the Caiaphas, who was a, a high priest appointed by a Roman general, not God, God took him, stood him up, and made him declare that one must die on the cross to save the nation Israel. He had no intention of saying that, but God forced him. That's a miracle, and that's letting you know God will use whomever he chooses. So here he chooses to use Judas Iscariot. Verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he knew the very purpose, the plan for, he rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. He laid aside his dress top coat and took a towel and girded himself. Um, verse 5, after that he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel wherewith he was girded. In other words, he took that and, and uh, utilized it. Uh, verse 6, then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Question. He was embarrassed. This was the Messiah washing Peter's feet. Verse 7, Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. And uh, understanding does come. Let's, let's, let's look at this a little bit. What did people wear for shoes in that day? It was usually with sandals. What kind of road did they walk up on dirt? What happens when you wear sandals and you walk large distances in dirt road? Your feet become, as we used to say, rusty. Uh, you know, when you'd be playing barefooted all day. I mean, you're really dirty. And what Christ is saying here to man is that whoever you are, when you walk on this earth, you're going to get some dirt. You're going to get dirty in this world. But Christ and only Christ can cleanse you. When you believe on him, this is a spiritual thing. You know, if it, somebody wants to wash somebody's feet, hey, more power to you. But the, he's using this as an example. Don't lose the deeper meaning. Is that when you're in flesh bodies on this earth, you're going to get dirty. You're going to fall short sometimes. But the Savior can raise you, cleanse you. That you can understand even today. And they would soon. Verse 8, Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou, shalt, thou hast no part with me. In other words, um, if you do not allow Christ to cleanse you, you're not going to make it. Verse 9, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. If, if that's what it means, wash me all over. I really want to make it. Well, that's what he does in reality. When he forgives you of all your shortcomings and erases it from the book of life where you're not judged for that, then that makes it perfect. And that's the way Christ cleanses people. Verse 10, Jesus said to him, 
he that is washed needeth not save to uh, needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. There's one of you here that's not clean. And of course, he's referring to Joseph of Arimathea. I'm sorry, of uh, Judas Iscariot. And uh, that's who he's referring to. Out of the twelve, there's one that's not clean. So you could have washed his feet a, do a dozen times. He still wouldn't have been clean. Why? Because he, the devil was working in him. Verse 11, for he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, ye are not all clean. Verse 12. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Do you understand it? Verse 13. You call me master and Lord. And you say, well, for so I am. And there's I am again. The light and I am. And where those two are is always the Holy Spirit. Verse 14, if I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. In other words, th th this doesn't mean literal. It means if I cleanse you spiritually of your sins, then you should, the brethren, you should help hold them up. You should support them and encourage them. You should lead them to Christ, which is the cleanser. Only he can cleanse, you can't. Okay. You can be a servant and a sent one of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's still Christ that does the cleansing. Uh, and, and understand, I'm speaking spiritual here. And that's, that is the message. So you're supposed to support each other, to encourage each other, to uphold each other. 15, for I have given you an example. That's all it is, an example that you should do as I have done to you. And that's, you should humbly serve the church. You should humbly serve the brethren when, when um, God sends you, and, uh, and, and so it is. 16, verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. What, what, is, what is a sent one? Do you, do you know what the word is in the Greek? It's apostle. Apostle, an apostle is never greater than Lord God Almighty. An apostle cannot forgive sin. I know that there are certain traditions and so forth where some men may say they can. They can't. There's only one that he might be a sent one. He might be a servant of he who can forgive sin. But uh, man cannot forgive sin. Only God can. But man can, being a sent one, and there's no gender in this, male or female, in planting seeds and upholding and serving humbly can lead people to Christ who can wash them whiter than snow, forgiving sin, and leading them in a direction that they should go, and how precious that is. Uh, so, no... The sent one is never, ever, ever above the master, the Lord, because it is the Lord that sends them. Okay, next verse, please. Verse 17. If you know these things, if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. They'll, they'll, they'll round out your life, make life a lot easier for you. Why? Because God's blessings are going to follow it. If he gives you a commandment and you follow it, you're blessed. 18, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen. They follow me. Okay. 
but that the scripture might be fulfilled. Understand now, listen, that the scripture might be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me, as it's written in um, Psalms 41, verse 9. And you can read it there, that his own friend will betray him. And as they were eating bread, what, what was Christ? He was the bread of life. Born at Bethlehem. What does Bethlehem mean? Bread. The house of bread. And the, the, the solidity that gives us life, eternal life, uh, and certainly Judas uh, falling short here and Christ pointing that out. I, I don't want you to overlook the fact. I, drew attention to sent one being an apostle. But also, he says, I know whom I have chosen. You see, that's God's election. God's elect are a people, they're not any better than anyone else. If anything, it should humble them more than anyone else. But they have eyes to see and ears to hear and to know the very truth and understand why Christ did these things, why he accomplished them. And, and so it is. Uh, so the scripture might be fulfilled, so that that Psalms 41 could come to life. Uh, and so it was. 19. Now I tell you before it came, uh, come rather, that when it is come to pass, you may believe that I am he. There's that sacred name again. I am, and so it is. Uh, I am being Yahweh, our Heavenly Father. I want you to know it's one and the same. And as he sits at the right hand of God, even at this time, as your intercessor, to stand between the world and you, to strengthen you. Why? Because he's chosen you. He knows where you are, and he knows what he wishes that you humbly carry these things forth. How precious it is to know truth and to understand the living word, because that's what we're judged by. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We will not judge people. Uh, we have one judge. That's our father. But again, you do have the right and the gift of spiritual discernment to understand truth when you hear it. And um, that is a gift, and to know when something should not be heard and put aside. That's certainly God's way of leading and teaching his, um, his flock. Okay, those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Got a prayer request? You don't need that number. You don't need an address. All you need to do is let God know you love him. You don't even have to say it out loud because he reads your mind. He's a heart knower. And uh, you can pray anytime you want to. No one can even tell. So never let anyone take that away from you. 
That's the freedoms we have in serving the living God. So let's go to his throne. Father, around the world we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, question time. We're going to go with Gregory from Connecticut. Was there ever another Eve, and was her name Lilith? In the Jewish language, it's spelled L-I-L-I-T-S. Uh, this, this is, um, you know, some people that are scholars and know the word, know there were people created on the sixth day. And unfortunately, this is the method in many cases that is utilized to explain to the deeper scholar, or try to, why there were people on the sixth day. And they missed the mark because uh, Lilith did, has never existed. She was a sexual goddess, so to speak, in mythology. Uh, but God created all the nations, that's to say all the Gentiles, all the races, on the sixth day. He rested the seventh, and then he brought forth Eth Ha'adon, different man, through whom Mother Eve would bring forth in biblical cord to in biblical cord the Lord Jesus Christ. And God kept that line pure all the way through until that birth came to pass. Lilith is mythology, and unfortunately, um, it falls so far short of the mark of truth that all the, you know, I'll never forget, God created all the races. What's the last verse of the, of the first chapter of Genesis? And he looked and it was good. He loves his children regardless of what race they are. And don't ever let man tell you that some race, because of somebody's sin, uh, curses were put on. That's a malarkey. Okay. God doesn't put burdens on people. People put burdens on themselves. Marie from Florida, please explain Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 and 5. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 and 5, those, you know, in the Greek, you need to know the difference between nikos and nikos. One is a corpse, and the other is like death spiritually. But what it means is the people that are not on the right side of paradise, when the first day of the millennium comes, they must remain spiritually dead until the last day of the millennium when uh, Satan is released and they're tested. If they go back to him again, it's, uh, it, it's goodbye. But the reason they must stay spiritually dead is they're not tested. They are, have been taught, but until Satan is released, that's their test. And obviously from, from verse 10 of that same chapter, uh, many are going to be deceived. They're going to go back to Satan. How that could be, I, I have great um, difficulty in understanding, but it is written that they shall. And actually in the fifth verse, it states how that we will be priests with Christ for a thousand years, teaching, trying. Mark from Texas, why did God create an evil spirit like Satan? God did not create Satan evil. Satan became evil himself. You can read a great deal about Satan as the prince and the king of Tyrus. The prince is after his fall and the king is, is before his fall. He, he was, God was real proud of him. God made him the full pattern huh? because he earned it and was elevated to where he was the cherubim that protected the mercy seat. That's a Messiah connotation, meaning the Lord. And, but he got so proud of himself, as you will read in that 28th chapter of Ezekiel, that he wanted that seed himself, and pride caused his downfall. And he is the son of perdition that is already sentenced to death 
in the 18th and 19th verses of that Ezekiel chapter 28. That's why, don't ever let somebody tell you the son of perdition is somebody else. It's not, because he's the only named entity by name that is going to perish. Okay, and that's what perdition means. David from Arkansas, is the remnant a good or a bad thing? The remnant is a very good thing. And I'm going to speak of the remnant that is mentioned in Romans chapter 11. God said, you've always had this remnant coming forth, but the election <clears throat> or will never bow a knee to Baal when he appears as Antichrist. So uh, what, what it means is we've always had Isaiah and Daniel and, and all the teachers and the prophets that have come forward, the remnant, they're dead, yes, but they were still the remnant that brought forth the real truth so that we in this generation have had the truth passed on to us whereby we can exercise the same authority uh, that God would have us exercise in bringing forth that truth. Uh, but the remnant, that particular remnant of Romans 11 was very good. Uh, and this would be Kay from Indiana. Someone recently told me that paradise was done away with when Jesus died on the cross. Can you explain to me where he, she heard this or was taught this? I can think where maybe she might be very confused about 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, where it says Christ went to paradise all the way back to the time of Noah and taught the gospel message to them so that they could be saved by Christ so much if they chose him. And it stated that many were set free. but. Paradise is always there, and there is a gulf in the middle. You see, wh where would people go then? As it is written in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, 6 and 7, when, you, when the silver cord parts, when you kick the bucket, <clears throat> your spirit, which is the intellect of your soul, meaning your spiritual body, instantly returns to the Father from whence it came. You came from there, and when that cord parts, you're going back. Okay. So, well, where, where are they then? And they're in paradise. That's why Luke 16 makes it very clear. Paradise is until the millennium. Uh, Lisa from Michigan, uh, or can't, there we can, the, are we in the fifth trump? Please explain this. Yeah, the fifth trump is a time of learning. What does the fifth trump teach you? It teaches you even how long the false Christ will be here, five months. And the fifth seal does the same thing. It's a time of teaching. And that's what it's all about, is learning there is a false Christ. You know, there, it, it is astounding that how many people in this world today don't realize that the false Christ comes first, that what he claims to be is Christ. That's why he's called that. He's called instead of Christ because he claims to be. And there are a lot of people so biblically illiterate that they're going to worship him thinking it is Christ. Why? They haven't studied the Word. The Word can set you free. The Word can give you wisdom and knowledge, whereby you are never deceived. But the fifth trump is the time of teaching. The sixth, that's a different story. That's when the Antichrist appears on earth de facto. Uh, Rebecca and Kyle from Indiana, Pastor Murray, my granddaughter, Kyle, age nine, likes to watch your program when she comes to my house. She asked me if we will be able to see God's face when we go to heaven. I don't, I, w I don't know for sure. So we are asking you. Thank you. Well, I kind of explained that before earlier that uh, you can't see, you can see God's face when you're in His presence because if you were, you would be in a spiritual body. Okay, we can be in the presence of the Holy Spirit and feel Him, but. Um, 
but uh, actually, uh, when when we are there, we will see his face, and there is no, there is nothing dangerous about it or anything else. He's our father. He loves us, and we love him. And and I know your little granddaughter, um, Ky Kylie, uh, loves him too. She'll she'll be happy to see him in that dimension. Larry from Ohio, Pastor. Um, this Pastor Murray, glad to see Pastor Murray back. Well, okay, and Dennis. My grandson, uh, Scott, asked me, would God protect him from bad storms and tornadoes if he asked him to? He is six years old and is so afraid of storms. I would appreciate it if you would answer this for us. Well, you know, fear is a terrible thing. And, and the way you dispel fear is you educate yourself in about and concerning what you're afraid of. In the sense of storms, you would want to know a little about meteorology. That, that alleviates a lot of anxieties if you know how to predict the weather a little bit. But most of all is to be prepared, have a safe place when things are bad and know that these things happen they just do but a wise person always knows how to handle it to keep themselves safe uh, when when i was a young lad and growing up in oklahoma you always had a cellar that cellar in many cases it was to keep you safe from tornadoes and storms but it was also your refrigerator at that time, though it was not a refrigerator, but it kept canned foods and things cool, and, uh, and, and it was a good storage place. But you were always prepared and did not think that much about it when you grew up with it. So educate him about storms, meteorology, and, and uh, it will alleviate a lot of the anxieties. Um, C.W. from Illinois. Uh, what have we got here? I am 65 years old and I've learned a lot from your teaching. Great. My question, I was, I was born up in the, I was brought up in a certain church. I, I don't mention other people's churches, okay? And I got out of it because of their belief and so forth, uh, okay? I just want to know, is Jesus, if Jesus was born in a manger or in a farmer's barn? Where was the he born? I hope I hear the answer. I uh, wish your program, I watch your program every day. Well, good, it's good to have you with us. Um, uh, he was in a manger, yes, and, and this is why, you know, you hear a, a silly thing. They say, well, no one thinks there was a, a, a donkey there. Or, but that's what is kept in a manger. That is to say, a place where you keep livestock. It was a cave-like, it is believed, and he was well protected there, and uh, it did not offend him then or even later to be around God's creatures, the animals. Uh, Pastor Murray, uh, where is the great falling away mentioned in the book of Revelation? I have looked, but I cannot find it. Thank you, and you're so, you're so welcome. You know, maybe you should look somewhere besides the book of Revelations. What do you think? Because you will find it written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. And, and I touched on that a little bit. It's amazing how these things pop up like this. Uh, a little bit earlier when I said the son of perdition. But when you read that verse, it says, Paul is talking to us. He said, don't ever let any man deceive you about our gathering back to the true Christ. It's not going to happen until after the son of perdition comes and a great falling away. That's the great apostasy takes place. Um, and um, when the false Christ sets himself up in Jerusalem claiming to be God. So try, try 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, and I think you'll be happy. Brandon from California. The two witnesses' original time here was 1,260 days. 
which is half of the tribulation. So that means that they do not show up until the midst of the week, meaning Satan is here two and a half point five months before the two witnesses arrive. Do I follow that correctly? No, I'm sorry you don't. Because Satan also only has 42 months. Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. But you can't go by those days because Christ has shortened the time. Mark chapter 13, for the elect's sake, I have shortened the time, else no one would be saved. How much did he shorten it to? Revelation chapter 9, five months. That's two, two and a half month periods. Uh, and um, we can cut that. It'll happen. My question, this would be Nelly from Illinois. My question is, what does it mean in Scripture in Matthew where it says, pray not that your flight be at night? Well, I'm going to have to correct you a little bit. It doesn't say pray that your plight be not at night. It says pray that your plight be not in the winter okay, or on the Sabbath. Why would that be? Well, what is it talking about in Matthew 24? The harvest. If you are harvested in the wintertime, you're harvested out of season by the Antichrist. So you don't want it, you don't want to be have that happen in the winter time. You want it to happen at harvest time, and uh, so it is. Meaning, um, uh, you don't want to be deceived. That simple. Uh, Lavana from Michigan. Um, I and B H. Okay, my husband and I love watching you every morning. Can you? Please explain Acts 1, 14 through 17. We were told you cannot receive the Holy Spirit because we were not there with the 120 that did receive God's Holy Spirit. Now, that's false. I'm sorry, but that is false. Um, uh, God's Spirit is always there for you if you'll receive it. Uh, we're going to be getting to the 14th chapter of St. John here in a few days. The, it speaks of the Comforter and how he promised him that he's here for all of us. God doesn't play favorites. He doesn't have favorites in that 120 that showed up that day. He used them to bring forth the Word. But um, the Holy Spirit is God's Spirit. And he loves his children and that spirit is there for all, whomsoever will. But in the 14th chapter, we're, we're, let's see, where were we today? 12, 13. That'd be the next one. You, you'll be happy to receive it. Ronnie from Ohio. Were, were there people before Adam and Eve? And the question is yes. God created all of the races on the sixth day. He made some hunters, others fishers. You can kind of figure out what races he's talking about by the, their, their duties that they performed. And, and then he created Etha Adam, a different man, as a husbandman. That's a farmer, one with ingenuity that knows how to get it done, all right? And, and through that lineage would come Christ. He plays no favorites. He doesn't favor one any more than the other, but he did choose his elect and certain people to get it done so that everyone has an opportunity for salvation, whomsoever will. Kathy from Florida, how would I recognize the mark of the beast? Would I be fooled into accepting it? I don't want to be deceived. Well, nobody does, uh, Kathy. The mark of the beast is where? It's not on you. It's in you. It's in your forehead. Now, pray tell me what is in your forehead. Your brain is. Your thought process. So where you can be deceived, if you believe, let's say there's an example. You've been taught, I don't have to study God's word. I'm going to fly away. Do you understand that's what Satan's going to be teaching? And he comes first. He comes at the sixth trump. 
the true Christ doesn't return until the seventh. And if you haven't been taught properly, then in your forehead, you're going to believe on that one. And that's bad because that's, that's the one spoken of in, uh, earlier in this lecture, uh, questions, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. When Satan, the son of perdition, stands in the holy place claiming to be God and Christ, uh, that's the mark of the beast. It's in your mind or in your hand means you not only believe upon him, you're going to say, let me help you out. I want to serve the church, only it's the devil's church. So they received the mark in their forehead and in their hand. In another place, it would say in Mark 13 and Matthew 24, that woe to those that are with child and that give suck when I return. It's not speaking of a, a literal pregnancy. That's a blessing. It's speaking of a spiritual impregnation and then nursing along Satan's work. Uh, you don't want to go there. And I am out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Do you know what? When you read this letter that he sent to you and study it in earnest, it makes his day. And when you make God's day, boy, is he going to make yours. You can count on it. It means he loves you. And he will return that. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me. Listen good now. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus Yeshua is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The book of Peter, here we have two books, first and second Peter, that, that are absolutely fascinating. That great old fisherman telling us, leading us, directing us, guiding us, going into the depth, if you would, in that second book, into the three earth ages, giving the most accurate recorded account of the events that transpire and document that there are three earth ages, that there was one before this one, this one, and one to come. Peter, the great fisherman, which in his gentleness and his kindness brings us uh, two books, the books of Peter, that lead, guide, direct, even in your daily life, that teach and show you how to be happy, how to find that peace of mind, and to know yourself. The books of Peter, I know you're going to enjoy them.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word? Remember the subject? Authority. We covered kind of the first phase of it in the last lecture. And if I may, I want to recount to you the closing thought was Christ's message, his commission to the people, go unto the world and teach my word. And we found that our Father had placed all things in heaven and all things in earth under Christ's authority. Now, authority is a wonderful thing. And I'm not insisting that you go out and begin administering or ministering authority. 